Good afternoon. I'm Jimmy Lanley for Bright Ideas Press. Welcome to our Hangout. Today we're going to be talking about making science come alive in your homeschool. We have Tyler Hogan from Bright Ideas Press and a panel of three additional homeschool moms who are uh, science geeks, nerds, and lovers who are going to share all of their tips about how to make science more fun, more memorable, and easier for you, mom. This is not scary. You can do this. Again, we're really happy to have you with us today to talk about homeschool science. So we're going to let the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Tyler Hogan. Well, I'm Tyler Hogan, and uh, I was homeschooled from kindergarten on, and my wife, Helen, is also a, a homeschool graduate, and we've got four little kiddos, uh, girls ages uh, five, three, and two, and a little boy is about two months old. Thank you, Tyler. We always love having you on the Hangouts. Tisha, will you please introduce yourself all the way from warm 60-degree Texas? Oh, we can't hear you, Tisha. Oh, no, we lost your sound. Okay, we're going to skip over to Heather. I see that you're not muted, but we cannot hear you. So, Heather, I'm going to go ahead and let Heather introduce herself all the way up in freezing cold New York. That's right. I'm Heather Woody from New York, and I blog at blogshewrote.org. I have four children, 11th grade, 9th grade, 7th grade, and 4th grade. And I am a former middle and high school science teacher, so I'm hoping to share some tips with you today. Great, Heather. Always love having you on the Hangouts. You offer us so much. Susan? Yes, I'm Susan Evans from SusanEvans.org, and I'm all about hands-on learning. Um, I love doing experiments, uh, which you've seen a lot of on my blog, by the way. I'll talk about that later, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, everyone needs to check out SusanEvans.org. She has the best science posts ever and the cutest little lab coats on her kids. All right, Tisha, let's see if we you've got sound now. All right, do I have sound now? Yay, sound! I, like, disconnected a bunch of cords on accident about a minute ago, and I thought I'd gotten them all together. All right, I'm Tisha Messing. I blog over at adventuresinmommydom.org, and uh, I have three kiddos, twin boys that are nine, and my daughter just turned eight, and we do lots of hands-on learning. It's a lot of spontaneous stuff, because anytime I plan it, it just goes horribly wrong. And that's why I haven't had any science posts lately, because every single one has gone horribly wrong. I ruined a pot trying to caramelize sugar. I have no clue how to do that, and I ruined it. Everything. Everything wrong. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, to the people listening and watching, realize that these are real homeschool moms. Even though some of them have a science background, some of them don't, this is the real deal. And we're going to encourage you that you can teach science, you can have confidence to do it, and really just have fun with your kids. Um, let's start by talking about this common feeling that homeschool parents have that they are somehow inadequate to teach science to their children. Why do you think we have this feeling of inadequacy, especially when it comes to science? And then later we'll talk about what we can do to overcome it. So Tyler, I'm wondering, what is your thoughts on this? Why do people feel this inadequacy about science especially? Well, I think some of it is just a, a weird cultural idolatry of scientists. You know, they're the experts about everything, and, and we look to scientists to solve all of our problems. So if you're not a scientist, you don't know what you're doing, and you should really just stay out of it. And that's just kind of the message that it's, it's subtle, but it's definitely there. And I think that's one of the joys of homeschooling is getting to debunk some of that um, that, I, that idolatry, really, of thinking that scientists know everything. And no, it's scientists are just people who get to investigate and, and hypothesize and try and figure things out, but they're not inherently, you know, godlike <laughs> any more than we are. So I think a lot of that is just, you know, fear of getting it wrong, fear of, you know, I'm not the expert, what if I mess it up? And, and it's silly, really, but it's, it's pervasive. Excellent point, Tyler. I, I think you're right on track. Heather, you do come from a science background, so I'm sure you've never felt this inaccuracy, but when you perceive other people that have it, where do you think that comes from? 
Well, I think part of it is um, the baggage you carry with you from your own schooling and how you perceive science and what you think about science as a kid growing up in high school and in college. If you felt that it was out of your reach, then you're going to begin homeschooling with that same feeling of having it be out of reach and being very insecure. And I think homeschoolers are an insecure lot anyway. I think um, because it's that's just how it is. And um, and I think science lends itself to that feeling even more. Okay. Yeah. Great. And so I think that um, we just need to admit that we sometimes have this feeling that science is scary. But let's talk about how we can overcome that. And one of the suggestions that Heather had shared with me before was approaching science as investigation or discovery. Um, so. I would like her to talk about that just briefly and explain what you mean first, Heather. What do you mean by science as investigation? What would be the counterpoint to that or the, the contrast? Well, I think the counterpoint to treating science as an investigation is treating it always like a formal subject, always that it has to be done with the right curriculum, always thinking that the experiment has to be all set up and ready to go, that all your ducks have to be in a row before you can begin this really formal situation like Tisha says where something is bound to go wrong and um, I always treat if my kids have a question then we just stop what we're doing and we try to figure it out so we don't treat science as this thing that happens when we all get together we've read a chapter we're gonna do this great lab that's gonna show us this great concept um, but it's a time when we just get together and we say okay this is the question that you had how can we figure out that answer and we talk about um, ways that we can try and find the answer and it really isn't magical you know real scientists um, Tyler mentioned they are investigators and they don't have a lab procedure in front of them they don't have the data chart all printed out and ready to go for them real scientists make it up they have a hypothesis they have something that they think is going to work and they figure out the best way to find the answer to what their hypothesis is telling them and then they write the procedure and they record the data and it's not always pretty it's not always on a printed out lab sheet it's in a notebook that they keep and um, it's or it's on an Excel sheet that they create and then they just go along and they they look at their evidence and they see whether it matches what their hypothesis said it's not always done with a formal procedure from a book and so your kids can do that too one time we bought a whole bunch of gourmet popcorn as an experiment for ourselves is it better than store-bought popcorn and we had all these different kinds and we decided well which one is the best popcorn we had to decide what was going to be the criteria for whether it was good was it taste was it how big the kernel was popped whatever and we did a whole experiment based on this one question that we had which one is the best popcorn and by the end we had done all kinds of things but the kids helped us to make it up we measured popped volume we looked at the color we did all kinds of things and when we were all done you know our oldest we made him how are you gonna figure out the popped volume of corn and it was um, you know we'll just take the volume of the cylinder and so we had our oldest do that so it's kind of like along the way and it doesn't happen all at once so it's much less intimidating when you don't feel like you have to have everything set and ready to go was that a double blind popcorn experiment? It was, yeah. It's very <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, I just want to say hi to the people that are watching on the event page. Diane, Eva, uh, Renee, we see you guys out there. Thank you so much for being part. Eva, I wanted to bring your comment up on the screen. Eva is also a, a former science teacher, a uh, very sciencey person, and she's giving us a definition. Science as investigation is inquiry science asking lots of questions and testing your ideas and I think it's important to, to note moms uh, that you don't know the answers necessarily uh, it, you're literally asking the questions along with your kids uh, helping them discover the answers and you don't know the answers and of course as Heather was pointing out scientists don't know the answers when they start investigating that's the whole point of why they're investigating so uh, it's okay to not know the answers. Okay, so I have lots of little tangents I want to go down based on some things that Heather said. So one thing I want to ask uh, Tisha, I want to talk to you about learning even when things do go wrong. I, it seems to me that you wrote a blog post about that one time, didn't you? Am I right about that? 
<laughs> yes, I did. Um, I think it was when your science experiments go wrong because there yeah. was a. Um, we had this list of things of how to make a lung out a, a, a model of a lung out of a balloon and straws and a plastic cup. And no matter how I tried to stretch that balloon around the plastic cup, all it did was collapse the cup. And I couldn't get a good seal with the straw, and you had to have a perfect seal. Otherwise, when you pulled on the little balloon that was going to be over the cup, it wouldn't inflate the lungs. It just, nothing went right. So we had to do, so you can still learn from things like that, though. You stop, step back and go, okay, why didn't it work? What what was wrong? Was it, did you have the wrong materials? Did you not set it up? And especially with the younger kids, you're not doing experiments so much as demonstrations. So you're showing them, here is why this scientific theory works. Here is why this not, this statement works. And so it's a lot of going back and going, okay, why did this work? Why, why did our project not work? Or uh, why shouldn't I have caramelized the sugar until it became brown clumps in the bottom of the pan? And um, so it, it's a lot of being willing to just try it. And when it's not working, throw it out. And then go and Google is your friend, Pinterest is your friend, and when your rock cycle demonstration for the first one doesn't work, you go, that plan's gone. We'll bake that into cookies of something else. And then go to Pinterest, go to Google, find another idea, try a different way, because there is a million ways to demonstrate everything. Great point. And just remember that kids can learn through reading, and there's nothing wrong with reading a scientific fact to a kid. Even if the experiment didn't go right, you can say, well, this is what should have happened, or this is what we did wrong. So great point that we can still learn through mistakes. Um, I want to ask Susan some questions because uh, when I think of Susan's science uh, for her homeschool, I think of just super polished looking, I mean her kids even wear these cute lab coats and to some people that might be a little intimidating, they might just think visually, well I can't do that, I don't even have those lab coats and I know Susan would never want you to think that. So I want Susan to explain or reassure the moms who might look at her material and say, whoa it's so perfect uh, and help moms understand that you don't have to have this perfect setup in order to have great hands-on experiments. Susan. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I make mistakes all the time. And you know what? I'm not afraid to fail, even though I'm doing it on film. <laughs> and I mean, imagine if you were doing it on film, how you would feel. And that's how it is for me. And actually, I keep a lot of my, uh, some of my failures in the videos themselves. For example, in um, Earth and Space um, by Bright Ideas Press, that was a book I did um, all the different, um, uh, hands-on activities on my blog and um, one of them was edible sedimentary rocks okay and I disobeyed the instructions like I was I didn't read it right just like a normal mom making it okay and it said to pour it in slowly and no I didn't I poured it in quickly because I always do everything quickly and um, I, and it was all lumpy and it wasn't smooth like it said and I just um, you know kept talking and saying it's okay it's okay anyway and then I put it all together and the ending picture was fabulous despite my mistake and it, and it was a mistake but it didn't taste bad so who cares so I did not film the whole thing all over again I left it with a mistake in the it, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, those lab coats, we got them at Goodwill, okay? So any person can get um, a lab coat for a buck or two just for the theatrics of it and feel all happy that you're a scientist. I like a lot of um, just fun hoopla that has no real, um, uh, you know, specific reason to it. You don't really need lab coats, obviously. Um, and we sometimes um, get something wrong and um, and have to refilm it. Um, in fact, sometimes over and over. <laughs> and um, yeah, one time I was trying to um, make a um, let's see, it, it was a caves thing that I was doing for the Earth and space, and I put um, uh, some uh, Epsom salts on string, and it happened to be that my air was too dry. And um, and so whoever whoever wrote the book Earth and Space wasn't in um, such a dry environment as I was in. Well, my husband said, "Oh, just put a box over it, and that should fix it." And it did. 
But I left all that on film so that people who have a dry climate can adjust accordingly. And um, it has more authenticity and humanity to it. So um, just because my pictures are gorgeous, and actually I work hard on making my pictures gorgeous. In fact, I have to do the thing over again just to get the picture because I can't snap the picture at the same time as we're filming. Okay, so uh, so that is um, yeah, that's because that's what I do um, as a blogger. But that's not um, what you have to do at home. So you can just enjoy it, take the failings as they come, and go oops, and just laugh like the fish, um, the dissection squirting um, on someone's face. Just just laugh and go along with it. It's okay. Oh, that's awesome. So Susan, I want to ask you, do you do spontaneous science discovery, investigation, inquiry, or is everything very formal and planned out? Um, that's interesting for you to ask. I used to do more of the informal. Um, now I do a lot more planned out because I'm doing high school as well and my time is so limited that I make sure that all the things are done that have to be done and then I want to rest because it's too much as it is. <laughs> so, but um, when we're on nature walks or something I let them explore and things that we have studied previously we know and we can say oh this type of mushroom is such and such or whatever so we use our backstory of what we've learned in the past as a homeschool family to help us with um, investigations, explorations, things like that, nature study, and, and those kinds of things. But I did used to have a lot more open-ended type um, uh, science inquiry when the kids were younger, and I'll discuss that more when we talk about early childhood if you get to that question. Okay, thank you. And Tyler, I wanted to ask you on that line of thought. Um, I know that Bright Ideas Press has a science curriculum called Christian Kids Explore, and there's you know biology, chemistry, physics, creation science, and earth science, five titles. And uh, I know that's for elementary grades, three through eight. And I, you and I have had this talk before, and you've told me that you believe that Christian Kids Explore science is one of the best curricula for science for elementary level kids and that once kids get older uh, they do have a, a different approach to, to learning science in the high school years so I would love to hear your thoughts as a curriculum publisher as well as a homeschool dad as far as how the science perspective changes from elementary middle high school well the biggest thing for elementary students and for middle school students is exposure and teaching them a love of learning. So anything that you can do to make it fun, to make it hands-on, to make it enjoyable and memorable, that's what it's all about. So all of our Christian Kids Explore titles, they're designed for a lot of hands-on projects. And not like in an intimidating, oh my, that's so many hands-on things. It's every lesson is just a simple amount of text. It's it's not a lot of textbooky reading that you have to do, but it's enough to, to get a, a lesson's worth of material in and then how do we apply that? What's a hands-on project or a demonstration that would make that fun and interesting? If um, if you're looking, we've had some people actually who have used uh, chemistry and physics and have used that in high school and what they've done is, I mean the chemistry and the physics books have the same uh, table of contents basically as you would find in a high school version of, of those programs, uh, but they lack the, the algebra. So we've had people who have had either math challenge students um, who they want to get the concepts, but they know they're just not going to be able to keep up with all the algebra, and they'll even use the chemistry and the physics titles for high school um, because the, the concepts are there and the hands-on experiments are there, and that's what they that's what they want to get. You know, these kids are probably, you know, not going to be studying science in college if they're college bound. So that you know, they feel like they can get away with that, and that's their, you know, that's their prerogative as a parent. Um, for high school, you know, the numbers become a lot more important, and your priorities change as you're looking at, well, what's going to look good on a transcript, and what's my my college application um, going to look like. But for elementary and middle school grades, it's just about having fun, making it memorable, and developing that love of learning. And we think that hands-on experiments are they're just the way to go because they appeal to all different learning styles. You know, your, your kinesthetic learners, your visual learners, your auditory learners, all of them are going to be engaged. And especially if you've got multiple kids doing them at the same time with different learning styles, they're a great way to keep all of them involved. 
So Tyler, how do you use a textbook like Christian Kids Explore in any one of the five titles and still maintain this inquiry approach to science? They seem a little contradictory, maybe textbook, inquiry, science. How do you merge these two? Well, the schedule that Christian Kids Explore usually takes is uh, like a two-day-a-week kind of a schedule where the first day you'll read the, the text portion and have some discussion questions and then the second day you'll do the hands-on experiment portion and any review that you need to. So I think having it be um, not, a, not a super formal everyday here's a lot of reading for you to do, that helps keep it light, keep it fun, keep it interesting and having so much of it be hands-on really helps keep that um, interest high as well. Um, Another thing that we tend to use when we do experiments is we provide graphic organizers. You know, those lab sheets sounds a lot more formal than I think most of these are, but they're they're just places for you to record your observations and record, you know, there's some questions on them for you to answer, but mostly it's a place for you just to write down the things that you observed and to learn, you know, the scientific method and making observations and taking notes and recording things. Yeah, a graphic organizer isn't as scary, I think, as a lab notebook or a lab report. Yeah, yeah great. Tisha, I saw you nodding your head there. Did you want to share about using a textbook with an inquiry science approach? Um, yeah, uh, we've been using another science, and then this year we started using uh, Christian Kids Explore. And what I found is that uh, the textbook does, it just gives you a venue for it. The first thing is, is I let my kids pick the subject that we study for science, so we, we've gone through zoology, we did anatomy last year, that was interesting, uh, that was way too soon, but my son really wanted to do anatomy, and this year we're doing Earth in Space, and basically how it goes is we get about halfway through the lesson, and then we go, okay, well here, let me draw this out for you, and then it's a big, very ugly diagram because I'm attempting to draw it out on a dry erase board and I'm left-handed so I erase about half of it while I'm drawing it and then I redraw it and then after we finish reading it we run downstairs and we go okay now let's make that and we build it or we destroy it or all of the recipes that are in the earth and space have just gone horribly wrong every single one Everyone, that's, that sedimentary rock when uh, Susan was talking about it, I'd like, the, 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 if you saw my little bubble on the bottom, I was like, yes, that's, that, that was the one that just was horrible. I like literally carried it outside, I dumped it out, and I made the kids stay outside for about 45 minutes because I didn't think it would be a good idea for anyone to be near me. I was just that upset. It just, it was horrible. Yeah, so, um... Yeah, it, it, we don't do well at following the set. Here is the set experiment. The uh, caves, we had to draw it. That was the only way they got it is we went through and then we talked about afterwards of, oh, yeah, I remember when we went on this field trip to the caves and we went to it. There's a sinkhole near our house. So we went over and found the stalactites and the stalagmites there and stuff. Yeah, I, I, so, yeah. We but you get it done, Tisha. Your your ways might be or unorthodox or might not go according to your plan, but it still works. Uh, definitely yes. works. I know your kids are motivated learners. Um, another way that we can use a textbook with inquiry science is just to use the book as a reference. Um, I love to have these kind of books on the shelf, and when a question comes up, you say, well, let's pull out the biology book or the chemistry book and let's look it up. So then you can use it as a reference for the um the teachable moment you know that came up in life so it's a great reason to have science encyclopedias and books on your shelf at all times so that you can look things up um, let's um, shift gears and talk about supplies that are budget friendly what kind of supplies do you need as a homeschool scientist and how do you keep those costs down who who wants to share was this a Susan question um, sure. Uh, okay. Well, it depends if you're doing high school sciences or not. Um, elementary sciences, you, you can really use stuff around your house. Um, not much of it has to be purchased, especially if you're using Christian Kids Explore Chemistry. Um, the two I've used so far is Earth and Space and, um, and the chemistry one. Um, and those do not require you to buy stuff that aren't already in my home. 
So um, yeah, so that's uh, super easy. Just your regular like vinegar and a glass and a funnel and those kinds of things. So um, now once you get into high school, you really do need a, a microscope if you have, um, you know, if you're studying biology and stuff like that. So you do, um, you can pick up those um, uh, second hand or you can purchase them, you know, uh, wherever you can. Um, and so, well, what I'm saying is that for elementary, it doesn't really have to cost that much. And for high school, a lot of it is uh, what's around your house, but you do need to purchase some supplies in order to um, understand those concepts. Okay, for high school, you must have lab work along with lab sciences because you have to see how that works itself out in real life or you cannot fully comprehend that concept. It's, science is one of those things that you need to see it in action, okay? So that is one reason why hands-on is so crucial for science specifically more than any other topic, okay? That's my opinion. Thank you, Susan. Heather, I think you had a little contrasting opinion there on supplies. Well, I think um, Susan's right. You don't have to have uh, you know, fancy equipment when you're working with younger children, but I do have a thing as a science teacher about using kitchen materials for your science. And it, for me, it's just a matter of safety. And we can say that it's vinegar and salt and oil and all those things that we use in our kitchen but we treat those materials differently and often we don't want our kids eating them so it kind of just depends I'm kind of old school that way keeping things separate and it also sets apart um, what you're doing even if you're just investigating so you can get um, fairly inexpensive glassware and polypropylene which is a plastic that can handle um, hot water and things like that for just a few dollars per piece if, and it's nice to have a few um, graduated cylinders which are great teach measuring um, to kids too so you get some extra skills in there and beakers hold things and um, they are just for you know less than thirty dollars you can have a full set to work with for all of your science and so that um, and yeah they have a cool factor that is is excellent for kids they like to be to use it um, for high school too um, I was trying to think um, you can make use of, of um, resources around you so not necessarily buying that microscope uh, but having one available to use and one of the best ways to do that is to check with your cooperative extension every state has a cooperative extension university and check to see with them what opportunities they might have to get a chance to um, use a, an even better microscope than what you can buy. So there are lots of ways that you can reach out um, to get a look at better equipment without having to purchase it. Great tip, Heather. Thank you. Tyler, your thoughts on supplies for science? Uh, some of the most frequently used supplies that my family used growing up were a plastic tarp, uh, something thicker than just a tablecloth, but either a plastic tarp or a big clear plastic tub and those were things that we just used over and over and over again just to keep the mess contained um, that way we could feel fine about you know just getting in and getting dirty but it was all in one spot and that's Lysol a very practical tip really thank you <laughs> if you're doing dissections Lysol wipes are really important mm, yeah that's um, good another thing that was just super hugely important for me in all of my sciences growing up was having a good notebook. Um, sometimes, you know, a, a three ring binder and some scratch paper will do, but um, whenever I could, I like to have um, something a little bit fancier. I had one notebook that was just my favorite because it had all different kinds of paper in it. So I had, you know, blank paper for sketching, I had lined paper for writing, I had graph paper. Um, I think this one even had like a musical staff notation paper. It was just like you know five or six different kinds of paper all in one notebook and you can use it however you want. And notebooking was a big part of my science experience growing up. So just having all of those kinds of paper handy made it a lot easier to take notes and record my observations. Um, and 
you know the 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 expense is certainly a factor when you get into the uh, to the more specialized stuff. But a lot of the uh, either the equipment or just some of the special experiments are surprisingly affordable. You know, even things like getting owl pellets for dissection. You know, you think that would be really pricey, but they're not. I mean, you can get that kind of stuff for for fairly cheap. You just need to make sure that you've planned ahead, um, so that when you order it, you have you know your shipping time factored in. Um, but don't don't be afraid to look at things that might seem like they you know just by the sound of them would be out of your budget. Take a look because you might be able to find a really good deal on them or a good supplier. Um, Another place that we like to shop is a uh, Steve Spangler Science. Uh, he's got all kinds of kid-friendly lab equipment um, for for really decent prices. Uh, one of my favorite things that he has are baby soda bottle test tubes, and they're they're soda bottles that haven't been blown up yet. So they're you know they're about that big, and when they're inflated, you know, they, they heat them up and they, they put them into a mold, they blow up into a two liter um, into a two liter bottle. But for now, they're nice and small and they're great kid friendly test tubes and you don't have to worry about them breaking. They're practically indestructible. So uh, Steve Spengler Science, don't be afraid to look at things that might seem like you're they're out of your budget and make sure that you've got good notebooks with different kinds of paper. All right, great. we've got some stuff on the outside here from the event page I want to bring in. Madeline, hey Madeline, says, can you see it in action on a video? Now, I'm not sure if she's actually offering a suggestion or if she is asking an actual question, but this is a great point. And uh, if you're using Christian Kids Explore Chemistry, check out SusanEvans.org because she has done a lot of the experiments on video and you can actually see it in action, which is fantastic. Uh, and then Marlene uh, commented and said, yes, you know, Go to YouTube and look up some uh, experiments, even if it's not, you know, Christian Kids Explore. Other people have done these videos. So, yes, videos are a great way of seeing the experiment, even if yours goes wrong or if you just can't or don't want to do it. Sometimes a video is adequate. Eva suggests checking out the Cooperative Extension Agency or other agencies like the Forest Service, Soil and Water Conservation. So, look at your government agencies, state and federal, and and connect with them. I would imagine they have lots of resources that are very underutilized. Uh, and Eva uh, says, uh, sorry, that's the wrong one here. Eva says she loves the idea, Tyler, of using different types of paper and having those readily available. So uh, great, wonderful. Love having you guys uh, have your comments and questions on the outside. It, it's, it's very encouraging for us in the Hangout. Um, what about uh, hands-on? We've touched on this a little bit about, Susan, you were saying that you really need the hands-on to understand. Um, and we're talking about doing science in the kitchen. Did anyone have any other thoughts about the hands-on aspect, uh, demo versus experiments, science in the kitchen. Any other thoughts about that? Okay, Heather? I, do. Um, I think it's important to know your children because if you have a child who does do better um, not hands-on, that is definitely something to consider. And it's also important to know that not every single science experience has to be hands-on. As a classroom instructor, um, you don't have hands-on in the classroom every day. Sometimes you have to build that prior knowledge with just, um, especially in chemistry, because um, there's a lot of math in chemistry, and there's a lot of math in high school chemistry. You're not going to spend every waking minute of your chemistry time in the lab. And so I think it's important to keep um, your approach balanced and know the limitations for you and your students, because nobody is going to be having fun if mama is screaming her head off because something dropped on the floor or you know something went wrong it's much better time of day who your kids are where have a working space that you're comfortable with seeing something fall to the floor or that owl pellet I'm telling you in the classroom it's no big deal at home it's disgusting and I'm a science person but there's mouse fur everywhere it comes out of those things from all around the bones and it's like ah this is my house it's not the classroom <laughs> it's way easier to clean so it's kind of you just have to know that. And also, we use our, our knowledge that my kids have a lot. So as they get older and older, we've been through a lot of these experiences, and we just draw on them when we get to a new one. Oh, do you remember when we did this? What happened? Well, what do you predict is going to happen this time? And then sometimes um, they don't need to see it to be convinced. 
that it's going to happen again. So using your time wisely, figuring out what really needs to be done again, what doesn't, and knowing your family and what they can handle. I have a kid who he, he would rather read it all than do any of it. So he's a good demo kid. And so that I think is important because if your kid's icked out all the time, then that's not going to go well. So you might want to do that less than you would do it more. So really know, know your limitations. Okay, Tisha, about hands-on or demos, experiments? Yeah, I'd also add that there's just sometimes you're not going to be able to get them to work. Like, I, I never got that cookie building thing to work, but you can find videos. Um, that YouTube is a great, great uh, resource. Always, 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 always watch it first. Ever since I tried to do uh, I looked up kangaroos jumping and I was doing this with my then four-year-old and I clicked on oh kangaroo jumping and it was a, a very drunk naked Australian man attempting to duplicate how a kangaroo leaps and um, yeah that just so I'll watch it first no matter how safe you think the source is because it, I never would have thought that that would have popped up but it did. So, yeah. Uh, also, Netflix. We all know that there's things like uh, Magic School Bus and stuff like that for when the vinegar and baking soda that everyone does and goes great, mine didn't. And I got a chemical burn. And um, so, you have, you have to... Well, see, it was... I do have a gift. Um, see, it was... You put the cork in... And it's supposed to build up pressure so that the cork then flies off, and it didn't fly off. And so I went over and I went, oh, let's see what's happening. And I went over just as it went off. And so there was vinegar and baking soda reaction all over my face, and the cork hit my face. And it's on YouTube. It's, yeah, it's on YouTube. My kids filmed the entire thing. It's great. This is kind of the science experiment comedy hour with Tisha. And Tisha, we are so glad that you were on this panel. I, I needed that laugh just then. Thank you, sweetie. That was amazing. Um, baking soda and vinegar <laughs> chemical burns. <clears throat> Only from Bright Ideas Press Hangouts will you get this kind of content. Yeah. You don't want to miss these hang hangouts. They're amazing. Okay, let's talk about... Well, speak, speaking of content, though, just one thing to point out. With pretty much everything that Bright Ideas Press publishes, we always put in more than any one family should try and do. Uh, we never expect our families to do everything in the book. That's It would just be too much. We like to give you options because you know your family, you know your kids, you know your schedule, you know what works and what doesn't better than anybody. So better for you to have a couple of options to pick from and pick and choose what would go really well or what you at least think would go really well, <laughs> than to just be either overwhelmed or underwhelmed. But don't try and do everything in the book. That's that's just not feasible. And it's not, you know, there's going to be stuff in there that's just not for your family, and that's okay. Don't feel like you have to. You're not supposed to. Excellent advice. Uh, let's talk about field trips. Uh, how do you incorporate field trips into your science investigation? We went to lots of museums, uh, the zoo, we went to planetariums, farms, the library, anywhere that you can go, you just go there and you have a ball whenever you can. We've, I mean, we're lucky, we're in Delaware, and Delaware is not, you know, the center of anything, but it's really close to, to Baltimore, to D.C., to Philadelphia, New York, so we were able to get to... Uh, the Smithsonian, the Franklin Institute, planetariums, IMAX, all kinds of great stuff, lots of zoos. Just take advantage of the places that are around you and, and plan ahead. You know, if it's going to be a trip, like for us, it's, you know, two hours to get to anywhere. Um, that's all right. Just just make a plan and, and go for it. But yeah, those kinds of things are so valuable. I still remember those trips that I took, you know, from third grade on because they're just so much fun. And even if it doesn't seem like the science is all that deep when you actually get there, um, those kinds of exhibits, you know, no matter how deep they go, they leave an impression and they help your kids remember stuff. And that's really what they're there for. 
So field trips are part of this uh, investigative science kind of exposing, especially little kids, to science. And they're part of the bigger picture of what we do with informal science. Other thoughts on field trips, ladies? Um, we found some amazing field trips that you wouldn't have thought of when we were studying zoology. Uh, we were going to the pet store about once a month because it's a free way to look and observe different uh, classifications and like so we went and we sit, sat there and watched the fish for about 15 minutes and then we came back another time and watched the mice run around and uh, many cities have nature centers which are often free and they've got but ours is, an, uh, is a rescue center so they've got a bunch of different animals that never should have been pets that people tried to make into pets and are now permanent uh, homes there um, so also just the park I have a friend who she did a year-long nature study of just her local park and it was amazing the things she got out of just that one small park that I was going oh I never even thought about watching that so it was really cool to watch as her park change all year long. That's a great idea and it sounds so doable and sometimes we think a field trip has to be this grandiose thing it doesn't just the local park and that consistency of you know studying it through the seasons it's a great idea especially if you start journaling it taking notes it's a great idea. <clears throat> I do want to touch briefly on preschool. We just have a few more minutes left before we need to stop. So what are your thoughts on preschool science and giving kids that foundation? Um, I love doing science with my kids when they were really little because they had bright wonder in their eyes at every little thing. And um, like for example, if you can um, get some uh, cocoons, uh, actually caterpillars, you can get either from outside or in the mail, and you can watch them turn into butterflies. And it is so, it is so spectacular. It is so cool. And um, you can do um, a lot of science in your backyard. You can talk about plants and how they grow. You can grow a vegetable garden and get your kids to eat more vegetables, and they do, and they taste better. And you can have them pull weeds, and when they pull the weeds, they can see the roots, and then so you could talk about the different um, parts of the plant. Um, I'll, you can identify rocks um, and minerals, start a mineral collection. Um, we have like this science center in our home where we have different collections of different nature things that we found in nature, most of which we collected when they were quite young because they were just so excited they kept finding more, wanting to add it to the collections up on the wall. And then, um, yeah, you can have terrariums that you can have either creatures or different types of plants like humid plants, carnivorous plants. Um, yeah, I did a whole workshop on this at a homeschool conference once called Living Science, Bringing the Outdoors into Your Home. A lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, Charlotte Mason type ideas are ideal for elementary age kids and early childhood. So my kids had a delight about science as a young kids that wasn't squashed out by too much formality. I used fun uh, picture books or something to complement it so they had a, a basis for scientific inquiry. So that's just what I did with my kids. Mostly a delightful exploration of science concepts. And aren't all little children so curious about the world around them? They're just natural little scientists. You know, even just slapping water, you know, just any feeling a leaf, any kind of little exploration like that, and that is science. That is preschool science, all of that. I wanted to bring in a few more comments from the audience. Eva says, when traveling, try to find living books or nonfiction related to your destination. That She just recently took a trip to the Galapagos, yes, we are all jealous, Eva, and her daughter read The Beak of the Finch as a discussion tool. Yes, we are so jealous of you, Eva, but we love you. Uh, Renee says, coordinate your field trip with your scientific field of study. Don't always just do a field trip for the sake of saying you did a field trip, but make it relevant. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, Eva has another idea, a cabinet of curiosities to display nature collections. This was, works for all ages of children. And uh, Eva also encourages us that field trips can be as simple as a backyard, an engineering firm, or a national park. I mean, the main idea is just to get outside the box 
and just explore. Uh, so one last uh, question I want to ask before we close, and that is, is informal science enough in the elementary grades? What about gaps? Aren't you going to leave some things out if you just start exploring science instead of following a scope and sequence chart or an outline or a textbook? Yes, there will be gaps. Gaps happen. You cannot possibly teach your child everything there is to know, no matter how much time you have with them, but you can teach them how to learn. If you teach them how to learn, then they can find out the rest on their own. I see a lot of people who are really worried about gaps, and you just have to accept that that's, that's reality. <laughs> and it's not your job to teach them everything there is to know. That's, that can't be anyone's job. You don't know everything there is to know. How could you be expected to pass on that to somebody else? But if you know how to learn, that is the biggest gift that you can give to your kids. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Heather, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, I would say, having been on both sides of the fence, there are gaps in school as well. In schools as well, they're created by weather, they're created by assemblies, they're created by uh, teachers who think their kids know the concepts, but they really don't. They're, they happen in a million different ways, and so it's um, a sort of a misconception that there are no gaps even for traditionally schooled children. So I would put that to rest, and then I would say that yes, it is enough because when you have a broad um, prior knowledge base that you can draw upon, then you're going to add layers to their education later on. If you do a concept in elementary school, it's not the last time you'll be visiting that concept. It will come around again, and at that time you can lay on another layer so that when they get to high school, they have all these pieces that they can pull on to, to begin to put those bigger concepts together or to go deeper in a concept. So I wouldn't really ever be afraid of the gap. Excellent. Uh, I hope all the homeschool parents listening to this Hangout, either live or recorded, are encouraged and not discouraged by our thoughts about teaching science in your homeschool. It is doable. You can learn alongside your kids through inquiry, exploration, hands-on discovery. You do not have to have all the answers, and in fact, as Tyler said, no one has all the answers, uh, so don't even aspire to that. Just learn alongside your kids, instill that curiosity, that love of learning, and the knowledge of the scientific method. And once you get to the high school, then you can do something a little more formal. But in the lower grades, just work on inquiry-based science that is very fun and hands-on. I want to thank Tyler, Tisha, Susan, and Heather for joining me today. And on behalf of Bright Ideas Press, I want to wish all of you a great Christmas and Happy New Year. We will see you in January for another one of our monthly hangouts. Please check out brightideaspress.com. We have a blog. These ladies are contributors and great bloggers themselves. And you will also find a store there with the science curriculum that we've been referencing today. If you have any questions, just get in touch with us via Google+, YouTube, email, or the blog at brightideaspress.com slash blog. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for being with us, and we'll see you next month in January. Bye-bye.